Okay. I don't know if any of you know that, but that happens to be there's a sample tune that comes with uh, Studio One. Uh, this is the pro version, but there's sample tunes that come with the artist version, the pro version. And in our context, voiceover, we could care less about what the musicians are doing and all the features that are available to us. But it is every once in a while interesting just to see what the program can do and how they designed it. And I've learned a lot by looking at the sample programs and the sample templates that ship with Studio One. So in case you don't know, my name is Don Barnes, uh, Red Barnes Audio. And today we're gonna talk about punch and roll. And this happens to be part two, uh, but the reality is some of you were here last week. Some of you weren't here last week. Uh, either way, I see Michelle's on the line. Uh, I have to put on my glasses, of course, if I want to actually read, these are reading glasses. So, um, Oh, and we have someone from Voices Anonymous here, and I can't tell, can't tell all the names here, but Michelle's here, and John Oak's here, and John, well, we got a couple Johns, so anyway, be sure to ask questions as we go. If I skip something, you know, I can't go over every single detail, but last week I had something fascinating. So I'm in the middle of a live broadcast, and I went to do something, and it didn't operate the way I expected. And I used to play music for a living when I was younger and I worked in a recording studio and I just learned to go with the flow. If something goes wrong, so what? We move on, it's just like the rest of life. And so, so I skipped part of my demo showing off some punch and roll and on purpose. I mean, when something didn't do what I expected, plan B. And I actually have enough material we could sit here for four to six, eight hours if we wanted. And we're not gonna do that. I'm just saying that I have so much material. If I have any problem, it's that I have way too much information to share with you. So I'm going to give you a minor subset. Uh, you could learn about this program. I'm still learning something. I, I learned a new tip last week that I thought was brilliant. And there's refinement. So a lot of times I'm going to be showing you today what I call, quote, the hard way, meaning I might use the menu system. I might do something that takes four steps or five steps by click, 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 click. And then if you're a, a more experienced user, a power user, someone that's been around a while, sometimes there's just a single click that'll do it, or there's a drag and drop behavior that'll make it easier. There's a lot of ways to do virtually everything in Studio One. So just understand that in the demo, a lot of times I work for clarity, which may mean using the menu and showing something in a, in a context that's different than the way I would do it in the real world, where I might have a keyboard shortcut set up or a macro setup and today we're going to do two things we're going to go over punch and roll make sure that that's working and then at the same time we're going to do a couple little macros at least your first macro and i'll show you the power of using macros because if you're using this program regularly you can take things from three clicks or five clicks and cut it down to one click or one keyboard shortcut and the importance of that is you know it makes no difference if i'm doing something once or twice but if I'm editing a 10 hour piece of audio, 10 hour audio book, I've got one I just put up last night. I got the last hour. And with 10 hours there, it, it turns out that you do that same operation about 400 times. And if it took three clicks and I can cut it down to one, but times 400, I've eliminated about 800 clicks. If I can do that math in my head on the fly. So what we're gonna do, we'll look at Studio One. I'm gonna go back over. I had the music plan. There's great samples that come with Studio One. And when you're bored, check them out, you'll learn something. And, I, and let me show you, for example, I'm gonna share my screen. Now remember, the comments that come in from you are behind just slightly. The whole, the whole thing that's live broadcast here is 30 to 60 seconds behind when I'm actually live. So I won't see your comment in exact real time, but I will see your comment. I'm gonna monitor them best I can today. I won't answer all of them. We will, we'll leave out some details, but if you haven't joined our Facebook group, be sure to join our Facebook group and I'll answer any question that I missed during this broadcast. So here we go, Studio One. I'm gonna switch over to that for you. And that's gonna be this screen and we'll share that guy. And in about a second here, you should see that. And then I'm gonna take down the song that I had playing here. Put on my glasses for you. So we'll close that song. 
because you don't really care about what these musicians are doing. All right. Well, this is a start page for Studio One. I happen to be using professional. Somebody asked me last week uh, about that. And the reality is that professional um, is, is what I happen to use, but I don't use any features from professional. So don't worry about us saying, oh, this is professional and I don't do that. I'm not showing anything today. I have it so that if somebody else had it, and this is originally why I bought it, that th maybe there was something I didn't know about and I thought, oh, crap, I better have the latest and make sure that's that. But you can do artists. That's all you need to make this work. And don't worry about having anything beyond that. Okay. So I hope everyone's hearing all my. Uh, during the chat, be sure to go ahead and say you can hear me. Um, and and we'll go from there so let's see i i'm seeing people not hearing any music here um yeah yeah throw something throw something in the chat that just says you can hear me well or you're happy and uh, everything's working right for you so here's our start page now i want to make sure if you weren't around last week i'm a big big template fan and the template when you start off just simply looks like there's not much there I'll turn that off. And so by default, it comes in armed. And uh, I'm using my speakers here. And normally when I record, I have one earbud in. I should also tell you that normally my setup stays the same. When doing demos, I move all my screens around. This is more like what it would look like when I'm recording. When I'm editing, this might be big, full screen here. It sometimes is taller. It just depends on what I'm doing. But for the demo, I'll be moving things around it normally. Every time I come in, it starts just like this. It's exactly how I want it for recording. And it comes up with a track. This is called a track if you haven't seen Studio One before. And um, then down here, we have a couple other windows below. Now I should, I should warn you, let me put it back together the way it would start off. We'll attach this, we'll attach this. By default, when you open up Studio One the first time, there's going to be some little things here in the lower right hand corner there's some buttons these are called toggles and these toggles if i click on this this is the mix panel yours won't look exactly like this because i've customized mine i'm, I'm always customizing everything and you should too and over here we have our outputs this is related to the track here and this is my inputs so as i'm talking you can see inputs and uh it, everything should be, you know, should look, yours won't look the same. But here's the first thing that you'll want to do with almost all of these things. There's a little detach up arrow that is sitting here on most windows, and I can take this and detach it. And what that allows me to do is create another floating window. Now, a lot of times I don't need to see this information while I'm recording, but when I'm, when I'm editing, I like to see it. And some, there, there are occasions where it's very handy and i have some tools there's some tools you can't see i even have something on my input here um, that i don't edit. i'll just i'll leave that for now you can move these things around you'll notice if you start off and people sometimes have this too narrow and studio one does have a thing that if you're too narrow it will hide things and overlap things and so this could be hidden for you to begin with to begin with this is going to be hidden you're just going to look small like this and there's just an awful lot of little details that you, you go ahead and you pick up as you go. But you can always double click this meter. There's a little meter right here. And that'll expand that out. There's also a little arrow here. And then there's this, which makes everything wider. So I'm not going to go over all those details. But the big picture, the most interesting concept is there is this little button here that allows you to attach it. And now it's all part of the main Studio One window as I expand it and contract it. Everything goes together, but I'm always taking and pulling this one out and changing this window to where it is smaller because I and I'll tell you why in a second right now. I'll tell you why, because these controls down here are transport controls, which are stop, play, record, loop, uh, metronome setup, which we didn't do last week. I'm going to do a little bit of that today for punch and roll. And I like these controls closer to where I am. When I'm working, I like about an inch, inch and a half worth of space down here, but that's a personal thing. You set it up the way you like it. I have this console here, and then I have this edit window. And when this came up, it came up full screen, and there's the same detach. And why this is, I don't know. 
but the detach for this window is up here in the upper right hand corner and you won't remember all this but that's okay just you need to know it's there and this is a separate little window here and they call it the edit window so if you're new um, the edit window is pretty cool what it does is in the top section here which is called the arrange window we really should get our terms straight top is a range window this is the edit window right here this is a and then this is called the mix console where you have faders and other controls this actually goes along with this so let me give you a couple tips number one i always want to have this colorized it's not colorized right now but you notice right here it says the word raw right here now, all over Studio One, when you have text labels like this, you can call this raw amazing, because this is if this were you, it would be amazing. And you'll notice that I changed it here and it changed down here. These are working together. This happens to go with that. So this is a track. It goes with this particular fader and there's these controls. Watch up here if I press the M, which happens to be mute, down here, mute, so they're working together. I can go down here and, and unmute it, and now they're working together. Anything I do down here will be reflected up here, including little things like this. This makes our life easier. I can click and change my track color here. And so when I, let me make it ugly. Now you'll notice down here, Raw Amazing has the little purple, but that's not enough for me. What I like to do is in addition, there's this little, uh, let me bring this window up. I wouldn't normally have it here, but just for demo purposes, when I click on this wrench, one of the things you get it, that I like to do is I colorize my strips. All right, strip colorization, that's what we're doing here. And what that allows us to do is quickly put two and two together. If I go over here and I change this color, you can click right on the color itself, and then I'll change it to green. You'll see that slider, this fader, this whole set of inserts down here go with this track. Now, no big deal. If I only have one track, it's pretty obvious what goes with what. But as soon as I want, go ahead down here, and let me show you a couple, this is a, a fascinating thing. This is where I said earlier, when someone starts off, they do things the hard way, and that's okay. That's really what you have to do because you don't know any better about it, so you, you do it the hard way. And how would we add another track down here? Well, there's a track menu. And it has some options here so i can add a track here a lot of people just go in there's a plus sign here so i can go in and i can add a track here both, both those do the same thing uh, i also can right click down here on the pc command click on the mac i believe and i can add a track from the shortcut menu these shortcut menus are all over the place if i and that's the way i do it i tend to just double click excuse me i tend to right click down here if you double click it's another behavior it will give you the exact same thing as this plus sign or if i'd gone through the track menu and just chose something i don't do it this way now i'm not saying you can't you can do it that way but you don't need to so i just simply right click and we we work with mono tracks that's that's where we live if we're doing vo if we're doing narration so now that just added another track and you notice it automatically gave it a different color down here so that i can tell this is track six and this is track six now you might wonder why is it track six? If you saw last week, you know, behind the scenes on my template, I have some other things set up in advance. So I'm gonna expose those. There's, this, there's a section here I call the hide and seek section. Now that is not an official Studio One term, okay? If you go to the manual, you will not find hide and seek section. What you have are, is some information about the event or the track you have selected. That's the I. You have this, which is called the track list, which shows here are all my hidden tracks. So by the way, let me let me get rid of that track I just created here. Let me show you how my template was uh, before I did that. So remove track. And by the way, and for a lot of these operations, I know a keyboard shortcut. So if you're doing it a lot, learn the keyboard shortcut. But in this case, there's these little white dots here that people don't notice at first. Anything that's a white dot you know, has potential to be showing. This track two is sitting here and it is not showing it's hidden. So I have a track at the top that I put in raw audio. This is where I'm going to record to begin with. And then I go down to this track, which happens to be muted by default. And after I process, I, I record all my raw stuff. It goes out to RX, I do an export. RX does a whole bunch of cleanup work. When I come back in, then this track is set up differently 
than the first track. The first track has some tools on it. I've got an EQ and expander and limiters and some other things set up in advance. So I don't have to do it every time. And then I have something sometimes for some reason I need to export it and do something else with it, process it. And then I have an extra import, just a blank one that's sitting here ready to go. I have something that's uh, my pads, at the beginning of every book chapter, you need a half second or from, from a half second to one second, it's sitting there. I get to copy and paste that in. I have something for the end, I have breaths. And one of the things that's absolutely amazing about this is you can go in and you can, you can change the color on an individual event. You can change the name just by double clicking and typing and you can organize your workflow to make sense for you. Uh, Actually, I, I was going to say I'll put that back, but you know, really, it doesn't matter. Uh, you make it, you make it yours. You own it. And then this this track, even when it comes in, is pretty narrow because I don't use I, I use it for a specific part of my editing, and then I don't use it. And then to hide all these things, you do have some options here. People every once in a while they'll hide a track, and then they can't find that track again. But if they went over here, they can unhide it from here. So you need the track list. That's why I call it the peekaboo section it shows different things and some uh some some details and options are here and you want to explore these and then the one of one of the most important is this marker track we'll talk about this because we're going to write a macro that handles this marker track i have a start marker and there's an end marker and i'll show you that in just a minute but some of these things that don't apply to us if you're not a musician you could care less about these these two things here and here's the plus sign and there's tool tips on everything so let's recap there's drag and drop behavior for virtually everything um, there's there's shortcuts for virtually everything today i'm going to show you the long way to do everything but now let's do some punch and roll i'm going to do it the hard way and i'll progressively get easier and i'm going to show four things including and i'll show you what failed for me last time uh last week now let me go back hide these so it's i hate clutter Right, which is the funniest thing in the world. If anyone really knew me, my desk is not the cleanest desk. It's not bad, but you know, I but I dislike clutter on my computer desktop. So what's wrong with me there? I've got one point part of my life where I'm hyper organized, which is my computer and the way and the system. I have a system for everything, and I write and big deal. Who cares that I have a system for everything? What's more important is that you develop a system. You don't have to use mine. There's a hundred ways you could do that. And I don't really care. I'm not trying to tell you, oh, I have the ultimate system. I actually have a great system and I keep refining it and I make it better. And what I promise you is if you're watching this live today or whenever you're watching it, two months later, I will have found two or three or four or six or one or improvements to my workflow, a better way of doing it because I'm, I, I'm not locked in. I don't care. What I, I don't care that, oh, this was the greatest. It's not. This is what I do today. Anybody who, who I tutored six months ago, they come back and they go, well, why do you use this window differently today? Oh, I found a better way. I can't go back and tell everybody. But I, so start with a system. Start with my system. Start with your own system and constantly refine it down. Okay. So here we go. So we're going to record something here. Let me pull up a, a little, a little script. And uh, I'm going to pull my script off to the side the first time I read it. So you're not going to see it. It's sitting on my, my other monitor, and then I'll, I'll pull it back, and we'll do some. So the first thing to do to record, we're going to do it the hard way. I can use this little button here. If I'm going to record and I'm going to do punch and roll, well, first I need to have some text in there, and then we'll, we'll turn on the punch and roll. Mine's already turned on. Make sure we're set up right. So let me record something here. I have a single key. I could click on this record right here. You'll also know I have keyboard shortcuts for everything. I'll talk about those in a minute. But let me record this for you. And uh, and let's make sure that we arm the track. And then I need to turn down my mine here. Now, normally when I come in, I start recording like that, meaning here's what I did. I went ahead and pressed the record button. And this will this will be crazy. You, you'll do this too if you're new. If you've been doing it a while, you won't. And if you're doing if you've been doing it a while, you know you rec you already know. You go, hey, 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 idiot, dummy. Uh, why don't you arm that track? There's this concept in Studio One of arming a track. Why do you arm a track? Because if I had uh, four tracks or five tracks or six tracks here, I may want to record on track one and track three. And I'm going to turn this down here. But and so I could record on two tracks at a time. 
I might have a guitar plug, a guitar or a set of drums and record on multiple tracks. So because you can record on multiple tracks and you can listen back, you could have a piano playing in the background and you could be singing over that piano. And so musicians need to arm, they, they need to record on multiple tracks. So it allows you to do that. So the first thing you have to do is arm your track. Now, hard way. Hard way is you go and you manually arm the track, right? Don't do that. Set your template up, and then when it comes in, you're pre-armed. I'm already armed before I start. I also don't have this window here. I have this window showing here like this. This is a little closer to the way I would have it. So let me read this text for you here. And now it'll start recording because it's armed. As long as it's not armed, I go down here and I press this, and it just looks at me blankly like, uh, I don't know what you want me to do. I'm going to go back to the beginning. I'll arm. And here this goes. The single most important conclusion I've reached after traveling through Japan, as well as countless hours reading, studying, analyzing this fascinating culture, is that, you should, is that you should always tighten the cap on the shampoo bottle before you put it in your suitcase. And that's from Dave Barry. I wish I could write something like that. And I messed it up. Did you hear that? I had a glitch in there. And uh, so now I can put the screen. I didn't want you to read this in advance before I, before I recorded it so eloquently. And what you can see is that some of us, this won't happen to you, we make mistakes, all right? And I made a, a, a little fumble in there. And so this is what I would do. Um, I can now, you notice I couldn't even read a one paragraph without making it, although in demos, I always try to make a good mistake. And I, here's what happens. With pre-roll, I can go back in. I can, I can back up a little bit. Gosh, I should show you. Here's a tip, bonus. I don't tell most people this. I actually, usually when I'm recording, I have this moved over right to about there, and I have this wider so that I can see more. I like to see a little more. I do the same thing down here with this window. I actually hide it, cheat it over off my screen and widen this out. During the demo, I don't usually do that because I need people to see the whole thing. And that's something that I didn't do early on, and I'm gonna, pre I'm gonna pretend for today that I don't do that because sometimes I need, you know, like the file menu, I need some of these menu options to show you different things. So in the, in the demo, I need these. When I'm really recording, I don't need any of the screen that's off to the left here. So I just cheat it over a little bit and give myself a little more space side to side. If you're reading off a pad, you can make this wider if you want, that works great too. But the beauty of this is no matter how many mistakes I make, I don't have to go all the way back to the beginning and I can let it play back for me right at this point well let's play this uh, you won't hear as much i mean because it's playing back through my speakers normally i have an earbud in and one ear and i can hear my playback but here's what happens because let me show you this there's a little wrench down here and you open the wrench and that's called your metronome setup and i'm not going to go over why it's called that but musicians this would make sense to them we need to make sure that this pre-roll is set up and mine is set for three bars now in the real world that means that I am set up to handle three seconds of um, three seconds before of pre-roll. So you want to set yours up. Yours could be two seconds, five seconds, whatever you want. Ignore the bars. Ignore the man behind the curtains. That's in my case. That's actually seconds. Even though it says bars, it's line. And that's because if you're a musician, you'll know I've set this to two four. I've got a tempo of one twenty. And I'm happy to say that I was the first guy doing this. I mean, it's not brain surgery, but I, I see now the Reaper people are recommending this too. And um, so if you know music or you want to talk to me about it later, if you set this to 2-4 and like everything, I can click on this little two here and it'll allow me to change it to something else. And the same with the four and anything. There's, there's all sorts of behaviors down here that people don't realize. You just click on it. So how do I set it to 2-4? Well, there's an easy way to do it. So in this case, what's going to happen, because mine is set up for a three-second pre-roll, I'm, I'm going to put this at 11. And if I do my math, that's going to take us back to approximately eight. And it'll roll forward. It'll play back over my speakers in this case. Normally, those would be off. And then it'll start recording again. And then I have to find out where I was in my script. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to listen back to this. And the pre-roll will start right here. And oh, shoot. So I could stop that because 
you know, analyzing this fa fascinating culture. This is really where I wanted to pick up, but I wasn't there fast enough. So you see, I just recorded garbage so I can control Z. And if I'm here, control Z, and that just took that out. Now, behind the scenes, what I know is that I can go ahead and reset this manually with the mouse. This is the hard way. This is what most of us do in the beginning. We reset the mouse. I made a mistake. I undo it. I go back and I'm going to try it again. And then I would, okay, I think I need to start at the word here is right here in my script. So I'm going to go and try that. Is that you should always tighten the cap on the shampoo bottle before you put it in your suitcase. Oh no, I'm too short. So you'll notice that, that I was different. Now, either I started at the wrong place, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do wrong in a live demo. I could, I could have read that faster, but look at that. I overlap. I didn't even go all the way to the end. I said something terrible at the end. I overlapped something, but here's the great thing about using a program like this. that's non-destructive for one thing. There's a little drag handle here. And this is for my fade in and fade out. If I wanted to, there's all these behaviors. There's a little drag handle here. You'll start recognizing this in the interface where I can change the volume level of what I just recorded if I want simply by grabbing that. And also bonus, 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 all over Studio One in 152 different places. If I hold down the control key and click one time, it will take me back to the default. Meaning that if I took this and changed it, I press control or command on the Mac, a single click, and now it's back to its default. That works in 152 places. Exactly that. No more, no less. And control Z is your friend, of course. And so um, you can simply go through when you change something. You don't have to worry about, oh, no, where was I before? You just con control or command and uh, click there, and it's done. So in this particular case, what happens? You notice I was too late over here. Well, I can drag this back. So there's my end. If I had started too early, I can drag this the other way. Now, I just grabbed one end of it, so I have a blank space here. But watch this. If I go here, I actually, I'm going to, let me watch, I'm going to peel this way back. I call this peeling this back. But my original audio was still all there, and it is still there. And I can put this one over it. Um, what does that mean? It means that if I decided that I wanted to go and and find some old audio and listen to it, it's still there. It's non-destructive. It didn't delete it. And that's a big, big deal. Okay. I also can do great things like click this and there's a there's a tool here. There's an erase tool and boom, that's gone. Quote gone. It's not really gone. It's still still there behind the scenes, but it's we'll just call it gone. Now, I don't know what I did because this one came out shorter and I should analyze that. But I really want to show you some more about punch and roll, not show you, can I figure out what I'm doing? And if I'm if we're not doing a demo, if we're not live here in front of people, then I would figure out exactly how come this one came out shorter. Did I read that fast? I must have skipped something is really all that happened. But we can go back and do all that again. So I'm going to undo all that stuff. Control Z, Control Z, Control Z, and get rid of that, get rid of that. Okay, and there we are back to our original, I think. <clears throat> I didn't have to do all those undos. I could have just gone and reset here. So let me show you what happens in the, a, a couple other things. Now, I just did that the hard way. So I'm going to go ahead and pick up right here, and I'm going to read through this, and then I'm going to do a couple things that are a little bit easier. I'm going to do the control Z behavior, which is really cool, and it's going to take me two keystrokes. So I'm going to press R. It is going to pre-roll back to about eight seconds. Play that back for me. I'll pick up in the text, I hope. See if I can make another mistake. I'm pretty good at the mistakes. I have a lot of practice with mistakes. And sometimes I've heard this line. People say, I make too many mistakes to use punch and roll. And I always think, really? That's the reason you use punch and roll. If you can read this stuff perfectly from beginning to end, you don't, it doesn't matter what you record with. You can record on a cassette tape recorder and you'll be great. If you actually can read you know, five, 10 minutes at a time without making any mistakes. The more mistakes you make or the more you want to, tune things, then punt the bigger of a difference this is going to make. Now, I didn't say that elegant, elegantly, but it works better the more mistakes you make, the more savings you get, because when I'm done, I don't have any editing to do because it's already edited out. So let's do this here. And and this is something that I've done before. If I'm on the wrong window, I was sitting over here, and that'll drive you crazy. For the first few times, 
if you go over here and you, you're moving your script and you have your script on screen, you do need to have Studio One active, all right? Because the keystroke is going to go to that. So watch this. So we're going to record. We'll do it a little easier this time. You notice I'm starting here at roughly 11 seconds. If you look right here, it says 10.974. By the way, bonus, bonus, bonus. Uh, not many people know this one. If you want to fine tune where the cursor is, you can put your mouse over this and you can roll it and it moves by thousands of a second. So I'm rolling my mouse. I've got a really fast, I've got a high tech Logitech mouse, great mouse for doing this kind of work. And it allows me to roll. And if I went over here, I could roll by seconds. So now I can move seconds at a time through my audio. If I needed to move minutes, I could just, as long as you hover over something, then you're gonna get to that particular point. So minutes, seconds, just hover over these things, spin your mouse wheel, you'll see what happens. All right, so I'm at 11, pre-roll, run. Study, analyzing this fascinating culture is that you should always, always, always tighten the cap on the shampoo bottle before you put it in the suitcase. So you see there's, Oh, I know what happened the first time because I stumbled and then I paused and then I kept going again. And that's what happened the first time. So I, it just occurred to me what I did. Now, I don't like that. That was terrible. So I'm going to control Z. There's a keyboard shortcut here where I press the zero on my uh, keyboard. Now, if you're on the Mac or if you're on a compact keyboard, you won't have a zero and you can map it to something else. But you notice I put it back to 11.03 by pressing a single key. And then I can record again. Analyzing this fascinating culture is that you should always tighten the cap on the shampoo bottle before you put it on the suitcase. Oh, on the suitcase. No, see, that didn't work. And so if I keep pressing space bar, then it puts me at the end here. I could go in and if I wanted to just go right in here and just pick up right at this point and do the last little bit that I couldn't get right. But let's let's go back and do it the right way here. Control Z, get rid of that audio. Go back to that zero point here. Here's what happens, and this is what I did for months, and then I found an even better way. Watch this. Study, analyzing this fascinating culture is that you should always tighten the cap on the shampoo bottle before you put it in the suitcase. All right, now that one was semi-brilliant, but we'll just pretend it was terrible, and I just stopped, okay? Now, uh, we so one more time, control Z, zero, back to the start point. But if I wasn't on my script, all I'd need to do is, as long as it's running, Control Z does two things for me. It does undo and it resets the cursor back to this point. That's a big deal because I could Control Z and then I press the R key again in my case and I'm back to recording. So here we go, record. Analyzing this fascinating culture. And can, uh, this was bad, so I'll Control Z. It's going to put it back here for me and then I can record again. Now, that's just too much work for me. So I have a macro. We'll probably write this macro in a little bit. And this macro is what I call undo restart. And with one key press, and this is what didn't work last week. And the reason it didn't work was I had this feature turned on called return to start on stop. And when return to start on stop is set, if I play something, you notice I'm starting here at 11 seconds. I'm playing back. When I stop with space bar or I press stop down here, either way, it goes back to my starting point, 11.012. And when you have that turned on, it changed the behavior of my macro because my macro assumed inappropriately. I, I call it a bug, but I'd done hundreds of hours with it the other way and didn't notice it. It has this behavior because when recording, I don't want it to go back to where I started. If I recorded five minutes of pristine audio, I don't want this thing to go back five minutes. I want it to stop where I stop it. And then if I want to manually reset it, that's fine. Well, because I had this option turned on, then that's why my stuff failed last week. So if you go back, you'll see me start the macro a couple times. And then, oh, you couldn't see me. I was shaking my head like, what the heck's going on? And then I just moved on. It's live. It's live. And we did something else. So here's the way I do it today. If I come through here and I don't like this take, I have a couple options. Study, analyzing this fascinating culture. Is that you should always make a mistake and then press a single key. Oh, I'll do it from the macro. Undo restart. Study, analyzing this fascinating culture. And every time I press this, it just undoes this audio that's sitting here. Study, and then this fascinating culture. 
and then restarts the pre-roll for me with a single click or in my case a single keystroke and i click this and it's going to take out this audio reset restart one analyzing this fascinating culture and now i can finish the audio and if i if i was off on my script all i do is a single keystroke i'll do it with a key, keyboard here and it, this fascinating culture and then it keeps going here and it does it all with one single thing. Now, let me get it right this time. Study, analyzing this fascinating culture. Is that you should always tighten the cap on the shampoo bottle before you put it in your suitcase. So there's that. So in other words, I had the hard way. I'd stop it. I could do undo. I can set the cursor back manually. I have an easier way, which is control Z or undo command Z on the Mac and that will that will do the undo operation and reset my cursor and then with another key i'll start recording again or we can use our macro here i'm going to show you that in a minute we're going to actually write this macro i'll show you how it works and macros i really haven't explained it what are macros macros are just a set of steps put together in one operation and then you can assign them to a to a keyboard shortcut for example behind the scenes if i show you this macro go to my macro organizer and i look for that one and that's going to be under barnes record i believe and that's going to be right here and i'll edit this puppy and i'll show you this in a minute we'll actually write it what it does is it stops it undo it undoes or undoes i don't know how you'd say that it does an edit undo uh, it it uses the stop command again which moves the cursor back and it restarts the recorder so it just takes a group of steps and it does them all at once. And I'll give you this here. I'll show you how we'll write this here in just a, just a second. Um, but it combines them. And then if you see this, I got to assign it to the C command. And for me, that's, oh, crap, I made a mistake. Uh, and, I, and that whole take is wants to go. So I have different behaviors. If I got through this much of the performance and it was fine, good enough, then I can restart here. And that would have just been a stop right at this point, go back and then edit right here and start my pre-roll before you put it in your suitcase. So I can punch that in just as well. The beauty punch and roll that people don't get, and I, get, I, under, I see this over and over again from editing for so many different people. I edit for a lot of different narrators and some really, really good uh, narrators, not, not people like me. I'm an okay narrator, I'm working on that. It's not my strength yet. I'll, you give me five years or half a century, I'll get it, but I'm working on it. Um, what I see is when they have this, they are matching their tone because they're hearing this playback. They get the breath in there right. When you get good at this, you, even your, your pickup, because a lot of times they're talking along with this and then they just pick up and they go and it works absolutely great. Oh, and um, somebody, John, John uh, just mentioned here, I noticed with the pre-roll audio, let me see, let me star this. What can I do? Will that, will that cause that to, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to get that to work and so it shows it to you guys. But John asked this question. He says, I noticed that the pre-roll audio cuts off in the playback just a bit before the recording starts when I'm doing punch and roll. And you are 100% right. Um, two things. If you get too close, now I didn't show this before. Bonus. You can zoom this. You, dra you drag down. Uh, this is called the timeline. So if you're new to this, this will at first, it's like, how do I do this? Well, you grab the timeline and you have to be very careful. The timeline is a very small strip here. I'm going to call that three eighths of an inch, but I have no clue what it is really. And it may be different on different monitors, but you, you can zoom in and out here. Now you also can zoom. Remember I told you there's six ways to do everything. You can zoom in and out here. All right. So there's a, a zoom control right here. You can grab this though. This is called a thumb. Uh, in computer speak, geek speak, and you can drag the thumb around and it'll change it. You can click on these, these uh, I'll call those triangles or pyramids today, and that will do it. You can also go up and you can drag from down or up to expand and contract, to zoom in and zoom out, and where you zoom does make a difference. So if I, it tries to keep whatever number I'm on, if I, uh, whatever point I am in the timeline on my screen. So if I drag at 16, so I see people doing this all the time. I did it too. I want to I want to kind of zoom in on the beginning, but I go and I zoom like this 
And then, oh, I have to actually then scroll over to find my audio. Where did it go? Scroll. Now what I do is this. I say, oh, if I want to see at the beginning, I drag at the beginning. You also can actually grab the timeline. As long as you go horizontally, it'll drag it. You can drag that. Then another bonus, if you take your mouse wheel, you can spin your mouse wheel as long as you're exactly on that timeline. It's a very small area there. And the scroll wheel will, will zoom it in and out. But uh, one of the big things is grab where you want to see. If you have four minutes of audio sitting here and you want to look at the three minute mark, don't come to the 15 second mark and expand it out because now you have to scroll over to four minutes. Not that big a deal, but it is the hard way. What I learned is zoom where you want to see something. If I want to see the 20 second mark, that's roughly where I start my zoom in and out. Okay, there's a little side trip for you. And then, uh, uh, so all that to, to, to get to John's point of the audio does turn off a fraction before. If I snuggle this up, this cursor right to my audio. So this is why I started to zoom in because I'm gonna snuggle. It actually turns off the playback because some people are using their monitors. You don't have to use uh, headphones to do this. And so rather than get feedback or to pick up both your playback and your new voice, it cuts it off a fraction of a second. I don't know if it's a quarter of a second or a 10th of a second, but it's a very small fraction in there that it is going to turn off my playback. It's not affecting the audio, but it is affecting. So if I snuggle this, I call it snuggling. That's a technical term from us cute computer geeks. And if I snuggle right here at this point, then it is gonna turn the, the audio off approximately from what I remember about right here, but don't worry about that. So you have two choices. You either don't snuggle as much because as long as this space is blank here, and you can see it down here in this window, which is zoomed in a little different, that I could have started this here and would have been fine. Here I'm fine. Here I'm fine. It's just, you don't have to snuggle that close, but you learn to ignore it. I'm talking along with this most of the time anyway. So I just cuts off, uh, but it doesn't affect your audio. And in this case, if I started early, I could take, oh, by the way, where you drag matters. I'll undo that, control Z. At the top, this will drive you crazy too if you really don't know it. Little secret here, not many people know it, is that where you drag matters. There's a different behavior at the bottom as the top. The lower third has a different behavior and you'll see the mouse, the mouse cursor actually changed. It actually tries to tell you. It's really good once you understand all the little things that it's telling you. You go, oh, I see how that works. It actually makes sense within itself. But at first, I'll show this behavior where I show, oh, you can drag this this way and you can drag it that way. You notice I'm dragging it, the audio, it's uh, the layer underneath and the layer on top. It's like a piece of paper over top. I can drag it one way or another. Control Z, get it back to where it was. But the cursor is different at the bottom and I get a different behavior on the last third as I do on the top part. So there's, you know, people don't know that. And then they want to grab this and drag it around. And I mean, I've done all those things. And once you know, then you start being a little more precise with where you do things. And they give, these are really shortcuts. There's, a, if you understand what it's doing, it saves you a bunch of time because sometimes you do want the behavior that comes from dragging at the bottom. And sometimes you want the behavior that happens at the top. So you should experiment with it, but watch this. Mine is set up that I have this audio a little bit before. This was actually my playback through my monitors. I mean, that's why it's such a low level. I had them turned down. So John, great question. Um, it will cut off the last little bit in your ears. It depends on how close you snuggle. A lot of times you there's enough wiggle room in there that you could be over another couple tenths of a second and it doesn't matter, but I've gotten used to it and it just doesn't bother me one way or another. Cause like I said, I'm reading along out loud anyway. And I put my, I like it here, right? Relatively close to this guy. So that my new breath, now you see, I cut off a breath there. I hate that for me personally. Cause what that means is if I move this here, I don't have to edit that breath later. If this was over here, I have a half a breath and I'll hear that while I'm editing and go, oh man, and I'll have to put in a new breath and that's okay, but uh, I don't wanna do that. 
I don't want to have to do any extra editing. So I'd move this over. You can slide it over and you can get a couple seconds. And the way I did that was there's something in their options, Studio One options. And I happen to know where this would be. This would be advanced. What is it? Audio. And there's there's a little checkbox here. Pre-record audio input two seconds. What does this do? This means before I start recording, I have my official start point, but two seconds earlier, the mic is live and recording in the background. And then we can do what I call peel back and get that if I want. So if I start my breath at just a fraction of a second too early and the start point was here, so I've cut my breath off in the middle, I can go in and I can adjust it. There's other things you can do. I mean, it's so sophisticated. And at first it will drive you crazy because you just don't know how to do it. But later there's a behavior where I can move the audio around within this little chunk once you know enough to do that. So let me look over here at the questions and scan those and make sure. Um, and I, you know, I see you there, Michelle and John. And who else do we have on here? Gary, John, and I, I got two, three Johns, Mike Reagan, Larry, I see you there. Um, I, there's one I cannot pronounce here. Um, but anyway, I'm happy you're here. Okay. So you can, any questions? I saw that one, John. Cool. When fades are not created automatically, how do you create them? Gary asked a question about fades. Well, first thing is on all these pickups, it automatically puts in a crossfade. It's a 10 millisecond crossfade, which is just perfect. Somebody went to, I, last week, I've got, I'll go over questions from last week. Somebody said, well, you know, in Audacity, which I've used for hundreds of hours, I did a, pro a bunch of projects with it. Actually, I did my first about 12 books with it. Um, you know, when you're copying and pasting and all, you end up doing something where you cross, you uh, you you press a Z key. And and if you use it, you know what I'm talking about there. You get at the, the cross points. But because it's automatically putting in these 10 millisecond crossfades, you don't need to uh, do it yourself manually. It's just automatically there and there's no clicks between this. But let's pretend we wanted to put some audio in and we needed some crossfades here. You select your events. So those are little chunks of audio and it's really complicated. The hard way, well, I don't even know if I can find it on the menu. I never do it this way. Um, someplace, oh, there it is, create crossfades. It's kind of funny. I've done it so long with the keyboard shortcut X, 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 X. All you have to do is highlight something, any pieces of audio, press the X key, and it put in these crossfades. Now, if I take out the crossfades, you know, then, then it would have put them in. So you select anything or all that you want, but most of the time you don't have to do that. There are some cases where you're editing where you might want to do that, put them in yourself, but by default, it's already putting them in there for you. So it's really clever about that, which just makes it a whole lot easier. You don't have to do that. So John, I hope that answered your question there. And then uh, will you show us how you wrote the undo restart macro? Yes, I will, Larry. I'll do that here in just a second. And um, I'm just checking here. Howdy from Minnesota and St. Louis. Lots of people. All right. So let's let's do this here. So what do you what I do want you to know is this. I didn't show you everything. I can't do that in one session. I skipped some things. I don't even show you why I'm using this down here. I've got them always in different views. And uh, my wife hates this. So when she records, this bothers her because she sees it in her peripheral vision and it bothers her the movement down here because I have it zoomed in and it goes fast. So one size doesn't fit all. Some people will have this closed while they record. I like it. It allows me to fine tune. There's some zoom in things. You can, you can do some things and I'm not going to explain all the details, but if you're going to, so let's make sure the other setup thing you have is if you want pre-roll, you have to have this little icon turned on right here and this turns on your pre-roll. There is a whole nother function called auto punch that if I draw myself a loop, you get a little pencil tool here and I take this, this is con what cro controls something called auto punch. And if I start recording here and I turn this, this, turn this option on, then it'll start the recorder recording here and it'll stop it for me here. I never use that because it's not necessary because if I went too far in my recording, I can always peel it back and forth. And so I don't really care. So if I'm repunching something in later, I, I'm not going to go ahead and uh, use that functionality, but I can, if I want to just really get one word in there and I want it to stop for some reason. I don't really care if it doesn't stop because I'm going to adjust it myself. All right. So let me show you a couple macros here and, and how I built it. 
and we'll build one. And what I recommend it is you just watch while we do it here. I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to turn that arm off. And I, I recommend you watch this. And then you can go back and, and rewind it and do it yourself. So watch it one time. So there's something over here called the macro organizer. And most you're going to have a little uh, wrench icon in here. By the way, if you don't see this, this is called, Ro I call this guy Robo Guy. I don't know why, but he looks like a little robot to me. And he's going to do whatever commands you want. Uh, open Sesame, you tell him what to do. And you can add all these here. Let me get rid of this. Minimize this guy. I'm going to move this guy. And I'm going to remove, remove some clutter here for right now. I'm going to close all this other stuff. What I should tell you is on my template and on your template, when I'm ready to output, I've already got all my tools set up in advance. I'm not going to go over that today. But you want your template. You want this set up in advance. It's so brain dead easy that I like I, sometimes I forget what I did because I set it up so long ago. So I'm going to make this a little bit larger here. And now we're going to go through and we'll create a macro. So the first button here is a little wrench on yours. And if you have RoboMan, if you don't see your macros, do this. If you're on version two, you need to install the macro toolbar extension from the exchange. Uh, join our group on Facebook if you have a question about that. And uh, we'll make sure you get it. It's, it's located over here in this browse window. You can go find it from here. I'm not going to explain all that right now. But if you're still on version two, you can do all this as well. As long as you have artist or higher, you can do these macros. So the macro toolbar is uh, the macro toolbar is kind of a hack. Let me just get that out front. Every Studio One is so well designed, and everything fits together. And if you know something one place, you'll be able to use it someplace else. Um, the toolbar is kind of a hack. It was originally done by a beta tester in the first version, second version. I don't know when. A couple of years ago. And then they integrate it in. With, in version three, it ships with it. But there's a couple little things about it that are quirky. And so if I want to create a new macro, there's a little wrench all the way to the left. And you click on it. Yours is not going to look exactly like mine because it's been customized. You go to Macro Organizer. And you could take and create a new macro. So I'm going to do two macros here. The first one I'm going to do is something called Mark Start End. Uh, let me show you what I'd have to do. Most of you know that when you export, one of the things we're going to do, export means I'm going to create an MP3 or create a WAV file. Uh, if you're in another program, sometimes it's under the file export. But in Studio One, it's under song. So that's one of those little things that when you don't know it, and people who are new to it, they go, song? I don't want song. Uh, but they don't realize that to export a mix down, it will export multiple tracks all together. This is what I use if you're in the free version prime the only option you have is to export stems which uh, i do use on occasion but i don't most of the time i use this export mix down and the the export range that i use 98 percent of the time is between song start and end marker now, i should tell you if i'm doing revisions i use this between loop regularly where i i had this little little punch in here and i'll adjust this loop to be just my new little punch in. And if I were really doing a punch in, then I would do a couple other things here. I would, if it was a punch in, this would be red here for that. And uh, oh, I'm already on a red, that doesn't work. I'm gonna take this and let me make it some other color, make it yellow. I wanna be able to visually see that I did a punch in and I would rename this. And this would say, you know, great book, great book, punch in P1, which I have all this code for punch in one. And then that would be labeled like that. So in other words, I want to be able to see my punch-ins. I want to th have them obvious. And this would be punch-in one. And if I had more, I'd have... And, and when I was ready to export, I'm going to just use the loop functionality to export that based on the loop. You'd see song, export mix down. I'd be here, loop. That's going to correspond to that. And then I'm just going to get this little three and a half seconds. It's going to go out. I'm not explaining everything about this. But 98% of the time... I'm between song start and end marker. Well, I should tell you, sometimes I call that a flag as well. And so when I when I say flag, when I say marker, they're the same thing. Now, in the peekaboo section here, we have our marker track. It looks like a little flag here. You click on it, and it opens the marker track. So one of the things you'll see here is that if I zoom in, zoom out enough, my end marker is all the way here at, at the end. Well, it's just that it's not where I want it. I don't want all that audio there. So 
it's it's not where I want it. Now I can do a couple things the hard way. I can grab the end marker and I can drag it over to this point here to where I want it to be. Now, it's the hard way, but it's you know it's a very accessible. Just drag the marker around, start and stop. I think by default it's at the five minute mark if you don't do anything, but you can drag it to the end of your audio. I don't. That's kind of too much work for me. Plus then you have to fine tune it, and oh, life is so difficult. Uh, but that's the gig. If you you know you can you can set it manually like that. There's other things you can do. You can Control Shift A and select everything on here. If you don't remember that, what is it under? I think it's under Edit Select, and it's on Select All on Tracks, and that's going to do the same thing. So in other words, you know you can do it the hard way. Edit Select and go find this. Uh, a little bonus: Explore all the menus, read through these things. You don't have to know about all these commands but for example i can't remember who asked the question i think gary asked but i don't i could be wrong about that about creating crossfades when i first got the program i explored every menu and i didn't know what everything meant but by exploring everything on the menu you get some ideas for what is available it's worth taking a second and you don't know all of them you know that's okay but you might see something you go oh i see fade in fade out that's interesting and and then also x is the keyboard shortcut so i select everything there is a command i think it's shift y what is it shift y or alt y i can't remember which oh that must be alt y watch this so if i take this over here and i have everything selected i know the keyboard shortcut so i would do it the easy way and select all now you notice these all these are selected this end is here i press alt y which would be option y on the mac and it automatically sets it up based on what is selected. If I only have a single event is selected, Alt Y, Option Y would set it on that event. If I have everything selected, then it's going to Alt Y set that. And, and that also works, by the way, even if the marker track is not showing. So I don't have to have that showing. It'll still do the same thing with the keyboard shortcut. Uh, so that's the hard way to do it. You can drag it. Um, you can use the keyboard shortcuts. What I do is, you know, when this is here, whatever the active, whatever the active track is, this macro will set it automatically to the end there. So let me show you that macro. Well, we'll write it, and then you can go back and do it. I'll show you my version of it. That's called Mark. Oh, where is it? It's under. Um, and you have to scroll through all these things if you're like me and have a lot of them. There it is, and I'll edit the guy. And here it is here, and I. I I'm going to just do it for you here in a second so you can see it. And select all on tracks. This is what I did manually. Marker set in an X selection and then deselect all on the tracks. You don't need all those steps to do it. And um, and then there's a workaround for a bug, what I consider a bug anyway. That And we'll just create this from scratch here. So let me, I got to get something up on my other screen. And I'm going to have this one here and right there. All right. So let's create a new macro. So here's a new macro. So here's how you create macros. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, I'm not going to include everything. I'll give you my macro if you want. Matter of fact, it's on the, uh, the Facebook group. I've already shown it there. So you can grab it from there. But what they do is they give you all the commands that you could possibly attach and use in a macro. And there's, I don't know, 200, 600. I don't even know. I have no idea. There's a lot of them, and every macro you create, you know, would be show up in here as well. So the point is, there's a lot. So I, I don't have time. Um, well, I'm going to do select all on tracks. Select all. Uh, you can do a part of it, and it will start giving you a subset. Select all on tracks, and I'm going to add it to my macro. Now, the first thing I should do is I should name it. This is called mark. Uh, we'll just call it set markers set markers that way i can tell it set markers live so i know that i did this live which means i'm probably gonna throw this away later because i skipped some things on this but uh we added that and the next command i want and i you can set it up in groups like uh, and, and that helps you later if you're going to find it and then put in a description what i do recommend is because your macros will evolve over time that you put in uh, a, a actual description here and then you put in a date so today is what is it, uh, nine, five, uh, we'll call this 2015, just for an example here. And so now the second thing I'm gonna want here is I remember that I wanna set, so after I've selected everything on the tracks, so you go through, here's how to write a macro. 
Let me give you the overview. You figure out how to do it manually. What are all the steps? And sometimes you have to write them down. Oh, I have to select everything on the tracks. And then I go ahead and I use this command here that says, do this other thing. And then uh, here's the next command I do. And you figure out all those steps manually. And you say, boy, that's way too much work. I don't want to do three keystrokes. I'm going to set up a macro to do it. And the second one here is I want to set the start and end marker. So I happen to know that the name of the command set. And you can see that under the marker section here, I may have to scroll down. There's that command. I'm going to add that there. You can move them up and down if you get them mixed up here, where you can move them up and down like this. And then I happen to know that the last command is, I mean, that's really all I have to do to make this work, is these two steps here, set markers live, select all on tracks, set start and end, and then I can choose OK. And I have a new new one here. And I'm going to just close this. Now watch this. Let me move this over here. And I'm going to, under the action menu, I just created another one. We call it set markers live. So the action menu shows you all the macros you have. And then let me show, I'll show you how to put it on a button here in just a second. But set markers live. And because I didn't have a track selected, didn't do anything. OK, and, and that that's really the way that worked because it was expecting a track. And now it selected everything. It did exactly what I told it to do. It, it set it up so I could do it with one single click or one keyboard shortcut. So let me go ahead and put this. Wherever you right click here, you can right click. It will give you the option for a new button. There's my new little checklist button. I right click on that and I can assign. I could assign it to a macro or I can assign it to a command. You're going to see that some of mine are just commands that are available. But in this case, I'll choose macro. I'll choose set markers live. And now we have that right there, set markers live. So now if I move this over here like this, I move my start over here. I set markers live. I make sure I have a track selected because that was important because it really is only working. My macro is set up explicitly to only work on the active track. And I want that for a reason because watch this. If, if, by the way, if you want to duplicate a track, here's another bonus. How do you duplicate a track? You can right click, duplicate track. You also can take and simply drag the track. And if you hold on to the control or command key, it will duplicate it. If you hold on to the alt, it will also duplicate it and bring in all the audio. So I just duplicated this audio here and I'm going to control shift A. I'm going to duplicate. So watch this. So now I have a lot of audio on this track. The reason this macro is built the way it is, is sometimes I want to set my markers based on this track here. And sometimes I want this. I have a much longer track or an edited track. And this was my raw, which could have been longer or shorter than my edited. And because the start and stop needs to be as long as a specific track, like I might mute this track and just output this one. Now, when this one's live and we use our set markers, you see it set it the end mark right to there. And if I have this one and I do set markers live, it uses this track. So it always is expecting a specific track selected and it will set the markers. I should tell you, I mentioned this earlier, it works with this open or close. So if I have this, well, let me show you, when I have it open, here's my end part right here. So I'm gonna close it, but I have this one active and I use my macro and it actually operated on this. And when I open this, so you know, when I first did this, I always showed this to verify that my macro was working right. And after a while, I realized I even had a command in there that always opened the marker track simply because I didn't trust myself and uh, I don't have that anymore. Now, the rest of my macro, every once in a while, you're going to find out that macros don't work without a few other things. Like I didn't like having all these things selected afterwards. So I went into... Let's see, you can even see it on my original one. So if I go to Macro Organizer and I find my original one, which is called Mark, and um, where's that one? I went by it already, and you would think there it is. Mark started in. I edit that one. It says deselect all on tracks was my last step, and I'll show you why. Because I just don't like that particular thing that I just did for us. Here it is live. I'm going to edit it. And I don't like at the very end that it has all these things selected. So deselect. So let me add another command here. Deselect. 
and I'm going to deselect all on tracks and I'm going to add that in and I'm going to okay that. And now what you're going to see is I'm here. Let me open the marker track. And when I run this macro, it's going to select everything. It's going to move the, the flag. And right here, where did that go? Boom. I'm going to click this guy and it unselected everything because I didn't want it selected. That's just a personal thing. I don't want all those elements, those uh, events selected. So what you can see is I set my start end and I have a one single thing. I don't even have that assigned to a keyboard shortcut. I have a lot of things assigned to keyboard shortcuts. That's not one of them. Uh, there's some other macros I have here that if I'm going to go down and, and import into a track some other piece of audio right after it's imported it. So let's I went out to let me give you context. I'm out in Rx and I've done something and I want to bring it back in. Well, I have these hidden tracks that are set up to receive audio. So let me close this. Right here on this track, I want to bring in some audio. So this this one will do a couple things. I'll leave my marker track open. It's called Wave for Export. It's going to allow me to go pick a Wave file. I'm just going to pick a random one here. And then what happens is it brought in this particular WAV file. And at the same time, if I zoom, you're going to see that it set the end marker right at the end of that audio. So this came in from RX. It came in from something else, wherever it is. By the time I'm done with my macro, all it did was the equivalent of song, import file, and then it did my little thing to set the start and end marker so that it's automatically set up because my in my in my world all right i'll take this and we'll remove that track uh, in my little world here that we had here at this particular point i was bringing in a track that i knew i was going to export therefore i wanted to go ahead and just set the flags automatically so i combined some things do you need to do this no do you need to do this yes <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to need to, meaning if you don't want to skip this and you want to take the extra time, yeah, file, import track works. And then you can go through and you can manually set all those flags. I am too lazy to do that. So what I do instead is I simply let it um, do it all in one. If I want to bring in a song that's slightly different and people ask, there's this whole concept, you know, they don't like all these events here, right? I see this all the time. I don't like all these events here. I don't like seeing all these. If I come from Audacity, if I come from Twisted Wave, if I come from uh, Audition, there's a lot of places where you don't see all the individual events and you want this all to be one. So what do you do? Control Shift A or the equivalent of going over here, edit, select, select all on tracks. I can do that with a keyboard shortcut. I can do it from the menu. And then you find, well, I think it's under event, bounce selection. And when I do that, it makes it all one piece audio like some people are used to seeing in other programs. Now, at first, I didn't like the events necessarily. It kind of bothered me. But after I understood the power of them, it's pretty amazing because you can create your own. And it's not just where you record and start and stop. You can create your own, and it works just great. But let me undo all that. Scroll undo. Uh, I don't Oh, well, I just undo it. Did an extra time. Let me get rid of this guy. Move track. Um, I'm too lazy to do that. So if I have a single thing, this a track selected, this bounce track macro, all it does, selects everything on here, bounces, and it does it all with one, with one single click. Now, is it really hard to go up and control shift A or command shift A and select all of it? No, I just do it enough that I, I, I have it on a macro. And I recommend you do that for everything you do. Undo restart is available in the Facebook group. Let me Let me scan the questions here and see. If there's anything else I can answer here, um, I don't see any new questions since John's here. And let me check real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. Why do you have a view song and view start? Why do you have view song and view start to start your macro? Why do you have view song and view start? Where do I have view song, view start to start? Uh, I don't know. View song, view start. I don't know. Uh, I don't understand that question. So, John, if you want to ask that, why do you have view song and view? Oh, I know, I know. Okay, okay. I right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, John. Now I got it. <laughs> Macro organizer. You were asking, 
See, eagle eyes. Good, 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 good man. Good woman, if somebody else asks, but not all John happens to be a guy. If you, this is called a, because there's this odd bug in Studio One that if you start right here, yeah, I, I forgot. If you start right here, there's a couple odd cases where you can have something weird set and it won't, um, it, it won't do it right in about one out of every 30 times that you do this. If you do the, do it, and this is called a workaround. I've written macro, thousands and thousands and thousands of macros in Excel in, in my days. I had a, 10 years of my life where I did some software development. And what I found was without those commands, there are a couple special cases that when you first test the macro, it totally works right. Um, but there are a couple weird cases. And then frankly, I don't remember the weird cases exactly why. I'll have to dig that up as to the reasons. Uh, if you have something specific selected in your display, and I just can't remember what it is right now, then that would it would fail. And it had to do with, you can actually, I think, have no track selected because you've done something specific. And I just don't remember it at this point. And so there are workarounds that make it work reliably. And I, here's another example. Last week, for example, I had this return to start on stop turned on and so one of my macros this macro failed one of the things that most people won't notice is in the macro organizer when i have my return to start on stop which is undo record i rewrote it since last week and i added one simple step to that and it's called transport return to start on stop and i set it so that whenever this macro is running because i happen to know if this macro is running i'm recording and if i'm recording I don't want return to start to stop turned on because that doesn't make any sense in a recording context. And so I automatically have my macro turn this off whenever I use this button or I use my C, it turns it off. So my macro now works 100% of the time. Okay. And so now that was a great question there. And um, I, I, I first couldn't figure out what you were talking about, but now I see you're talking about the macro. Okay. So there you go. Um, I hope that answers your question. If not, ask me in the group and I'll go from there. Now we've gone just way over and I don't see anybody asking any more questions. So if you, you kind of have your last chance there to ask questions, I want to say a couple things. One, I'm kind of a house on fire when I'm doing this. So I skip things and I, I miss some details. So I hope this was extremely helpful. Be sure to give this a thumbs up. I got my first thumbs down uh, last week. Be sure you're on our Facebook group. I should actually, let me stop sharing here so you can see me, but and I don't mind. I don't care if someone doesn't like it and they give me a thumbs down. That's cool. That's, you know, I deserve it probably. Uh, it was too long, too short, too whatever. And they hated it and that's okay. I've got, you, you, you know, you, you're starting to make it on YouTube when you get some people that don't like you. I saw a Stevie Wonder song. It's one of the greatest songs in the world. And he had, you know, 60,000 thumbs up and he had 15 people that said thumbs down. I'm like, what's wrong with you? But uh, so, so be sure to give this a thumbs up check out the other macros. There's so many things I skip while doing this. It's almost embarrassing. There's so many little things that I'll do that I take a shortcut and don't explain something simply because I'm in the middle of it and either I miss it because I know it too well, or I make a conscious decision that says, hey, I, it's just, you know, to, I'm gonna skip that for today. And I just, um, is this the only DAW that you use? Uh, no, I used uh, Audacity for a long time before I did this. I've used Reaper for a while. I, I've watched, uh, I don't know, I've watched 20 hours worth of Reaper uh, uh, tutorials because I watch, I watch tutorials on virtually every DAW that's out there because somebody will do something and I find a way and I go, oh, that's a cool technique. And either I can write a macro for it uh, or I can, or there's functionality in here that I never explored and I think, oh, that's a cool idea. So I don't only use Studio One. I have used others. Long time ago, I used Pro Tools for a while but it's been, a, it's been a lot of versions ago. Um, and an editing session, yeah, I could do an editing session at some point. Editing, is, editing there's so much to. What I can tell you is this. I've never worked with anybody privately that I couldn't take at least 10%. So if it's taking them six hours to cut it down to five hours or four hours for the same thing, because they just don't know the shortcuts. Um, if they, especially if they haven't been doing this a year or two, and I've done so much editing over the years. I've got thousands of hours of editing and I started on tape. 
you know, reel to reel tape back in 1970. I think I recorded the first time, probably about 1978. That's when I started recording, but in the old school stuff. So um, what does that mean for you? You're doing it the hard way and there's shorter ways to do everything. I haven't shown you most of them, uh, but that's just the way it works in these sessions. So check out the other videos. If you haven't joined our Facebook group, you know, you should do that. And there are a lot of other good DAWs. The, the thing about this is that the design within itself is very, very coherent. Uh, Reaper is an awesome DAW. It is the most customizable DAW in the world. But its design, you can tell they stuck features on and stuck features on. And go look at their dialog box design. And you've got 25 different things crammed into one dialog box. And you have to, if you really know it, fine. But it's, it's inconsistent within itself. And there's so many simple things that if you knew, how are you going to set a how are you going to set a fade? You have to go look at some pictures and know which dialogue it's in, and you can customize it like crazy. But you can customize this, and for what we do, and the template system, it's just a whole lot easier. I better put on my glasses, and I'm going to look at comments here real quick before we go. Uh, the Facebook group, um, uh, hit me up, give me a private message. It's it's all about Studio One. I don't remember. Uh, I'll put it in the notes here. I mean, I do remember it's Studio One narrators, voiceover users, um, but I'll make sure that the that the group is listed in the notes here. And, you know, we could go on talking about this for hours. So in private, I do that. I coach people on how to do this. I set it up. And then there's some people like my wife, well, she could care less about all these details. So in her case, all she does is walk in, she picks her template, it's pre-set up, she records, and then she has an editor and I do all her editing and she doesn't worry about it. She knows. I don't want to say she knows nothing about it. She knows the keystroke for undo. She knows how to restart. She knows, you know, like two or three things because she just comes in and she's great with character voices and just knocks out her recording stuff and doesn't know any of the details and could care less. And that's okay too. You can operate it that way. You don't need to know the details. Uh, but if you know them, if you're editing, then knowing the details will save you a boatload of time. If you're doing punch and roll, your quality will go up because you hear exactly, you can match what you've done before. And at the same time, by the time you're done recording, you're not going to take out any outtakes. So it's really great in that respect. So I appreciate you guys taking your holiday weekend if you're here in the States and spending some time with me. I mean, this went way over what I expected. Next week, I'm going to be doing one on, uh, if you're watching it live or you're watching it sometime in the week, I'm going to do one on RX and cleaning up dialogue using uh, isotope rx so that's gonna be next saturday it's a little bonus thing i'll tell you about but be sure you you give it a thumbs up you can subscribe to my channel join us on facebook for sure because there's a lot of great people there and um and i just saw a comment go in so i'm making sure we cut, got all the comments i appreciate it you have a great day i'll let it out that beginning and maybe something at the end here but uh i really look forward to seeing you on the wires and in the next hangout that we do, you have a great weekend. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.